Well, good morning. If you would, please turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 12. And starting in verse 12. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he, whom he named Peter, and, his, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was also called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Upon the reading of God's word, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning. Lord, as we're bringing all of our baggage, all the things that, that have happened to us, and the sickness that has ravaged the church and your world, Lord, I pray that, just like the songs that we sang this morning, that you are the rock that we should lean on, Lord, that you're the one that we depend on, and we can just lay all of our burdens on you. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, and that you would bring your word, not because of me, but in spite of me. I pray that we rid ourselves from all distractions so we can focus on the one thing that matters the most, and that's you. It's in all these things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, so, when, when, when I was looking, because I, I haven't preached in a very long time, uh, whenever I was looking at, at some certain texts that I was like, I want to, I want to preach on this. I want to talk about this. Uh, this particular verse actually stood out to me a little bit just because of the fact that uh, I like to study and I like to really get into uh, certain aspects of the Bible that not a whole lot of people know about. Uh, so in this particular passage, you'll probably notice in your study Bibles that there's really not a whole lot of information in your margins. Um, they don't have a ton of commentary on these verses, on, on parallel passages, things like that. It's just kind of generically known as the list of the apostles. Um, and we'll, we'll run through the parallel passages. There's, there's, there's three, but there's really just two. And I'll, I'll explain. You'll probably catch what I'm meaning by whenever I read them. Um, but we'll, we'll start. So in your bulletins, which we fit as much, in, and you can, you can go and grab. This is going to be a very casual sermon. Uh, you're not going to find a whole lot of, like, gung-ho sort of, you know, style preaching. Um, you're, you're mainly just going to be, this is, to me, it feels like a teaching. Um, but I know that God's going to speak through it. And uh, that's, that's, I've just given that to him. He's, he's going to take care of it. Um, but in your bulletin, you'll see kind of the list of the parallel passages. Uh, so I'll, I'll read all of them, starting in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. Uh, the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. We'll go to Mark 3, verses 16 through 19. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Boergnes, if I'm saying that correctly, it's been... There's a lot of Greek, I apologize. Um, but that is Sons of Thunder. Uh, verse 18, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. 
So you'll notice whenever we go into Acts 1, 13, it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to be missing somebody. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, but Acts 1, 13, And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. So we've got three different passages, and there are a lot of differences in the way that these passages are written. And some of them are a little bit obvious, like, that's where's this guy's name? And what's this name doing here? And sort of things like that. Um, we also see a name missing from Acts, as if you know anything about the construction of the Gospels and what occurs after the time of the Gospels, there's, there's one particular apostle that's missing. So let's first look into Luke's account significance. So whenever we read from the Gospel of Luke, we notice that it, it provides us a very small, it, it seems like a very small amount of context, but it actually gives us a, a broader understanding. Whenever it reads from verse 13, And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. So when we read about the disciples, normally whenever we read that, the assumption is, oh, we're talking about the twelve. And there can be a little bit of a, of a strange thing whenever you read the Bible and you're, you're trying to keep it all into context, you know, use your hermeneutic principles and things like that. Sometimes the disciples are actually more than just the 12 guys that Jesus called. Um, there's a passage, I forget exactly which gospel it's in, um, but the verse being, and one of the disciples came and asked, Lord, may I go say goodbye to my, my mother and father? No, you, no, no, one, no one puts their hand to the plow and looks back. That sort of thing, that wasn't one of the 12. That was another disciple. That was a different person entirely. Um, you can also see in uh, Luke chapter 8 uh, that from 1 to 3, you notice that Luke is kind of piecing out some of the women who actually followed him, uh, some of the women that were actually called disciples of Jesus. So, and, and some of those, you know, including Mary Magdalene and, and some of the other women that are listed out uh, that are less familiar. But essentially, anytime that you read the disciples, make sure that you check your context. And if it doesn't say the 12, then there might be some other people there other than just the 12 guys. Because um, you'll, you'll see in the Gospels the 12 as a quote, and that will provide you with, okay, these are just the 12 guys. Um, but yeah, that, th those are some of the, the smaller nuances. We'll, we're going to get into some bigger nuances. But I wanted to also provide a quick explanation on my research because I feel like there's, there's a, we're, we're going to talk about 12 guys. I've got, I don't know how long, I've got a watch. We're going to just, just pray amongst yourselves how long this is going to take. I'm going to run through it as quick as I can. Um, but we're talking about 12 guys. So... Uh, but before I start explaining each apostle in as much detail as scripture and tradition provide me, um, and while still respecting your time, I want to make it clear how I got all my information so that if, if there comes a time when you're like, okay, I don't, I don't remember exactly what I said, I didn't grab a bulletin, I need to figure out what, what the, the truth is, uh, or whatever the tradition might be. So I wanted to provide you with some resources. So first of all, you can just grab a study Bible. Um, I chose the ESV because that's normally what we preach on. Um, just want to put it out there. There's not a correct translation. It's just the Bible. Like the, cor the, the quote unquote correct translations are the Greek and the Hebrew. But we can't read that, all of us. So we, use, we go off these translations. Um, but there are, uh, there's one particular website that I personally use that I think is extremely, extremely useful. It's called blueletterbible.org. And you can also just type in blb.org. Um, but it's got a ton.
ton of great tools and resources. You can search uh, several different translations. Um, you can do what we are going to be doing a lot, which is uh, lo looking at the interlinear information of the Bible, which is essentially just parsing out the Greek and the Hebrew in each individual passage. Um, they're all categorized by James Strong's, uh, his whole dictionary and translations of the Greek and the Hebrew. Um, it's got commentaries, dictionaries. It's just chock full of awesome resources, so I definitely recommend it. Um, in, in my research, I also used uh, different names. So I would be searching for an apostle's name. There are also some other aliases that come along with their names. Uh, so, for example, uh, Matthew is known as Levi in some of the Gospels. Simon is named Peter. He's also Simon Peter. Uh, Bartholomew is Nathaniel in John. Um, so there are some extra research to be done if you want to do the full mentions and things like that. Um, but, of course, these are, this is kind of where I got that part of the information. Um, I also did the... Uh, what I used to do in high school, and I would just Google them in Wikipedia. Um, it's a different approach, and obviously most of the information that you get from Wikipedia is extremely curated to one side of the conversation. Um, obviously anything in Wikipedia can be edited, uh, thus everything you read must be proofread with whatever citation it's tying itself to, and of course you want to then read that citation and follow up with that. Lots of additional research, uh, but the, the whole point of me doing that was mainly to get a lot of the tradition stuff and what a lot of people that aren't necessarily on our side of the denomination believed and what they believe is truth, which is not in Scripture. It's actually outside of Scripture, all that information. So, um, we're gonna, for, for example, uh, Jerome, who is a 4th century theologian and historian, uh, will be mentioned during the sermon. And we definitely do not agree with him on everything that he talks about. But he is a very integral part. He's the, the author of the Vulgate, um, the Latin Vulgate of our, of our scripture. Um, so he's definitely a, a, a part of history that is important to us, but he's also not completely on the same page as us. So some extra thoughts. Uh, and then I also turn to Bible dictionaries. So I have a personal Bible dictionary that I got from my grandfather, um, but I don't recommend, with pretty much any resource that you have, I don't recommend using just one um, because you become more reliant on that information, less reliant on the average of the mean, the, the, the scripture itself, things like that. Um, you can go to a website called BibleStudyTools.com and you can find some extra dictionaries there to compare with. Um, these, with these dictionaries, I averaged out the speculation and things that I can learn from Scripture. They have a lot of different dictionaries where you can look up specifically people's names and what they meant, which doesn't necessarily help you with discussing the lives of the apostles or, or things like that. There's a whole theological dictionary that talks about like imputation and things like that. I'd recommend a systematic theology bo uh, book, but either here nor there. Either way. So there's some other resources and places you can go. This is just the way that I structured uh, the sermon and to kind of give me as much information as possible to provide you with um, speculation and things of that nature on the pieces that we can't really see. And as we're jumping into the 12 apostles, uh, I apologize. I will not be going by what the verse says. We will not be starting with Peter. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just, I, I, I tried to do it in a way that we discuss the relationships that are connected within the verses. I also kind of wanted to start with um, some of the less mentioned apostles and then go down. Um, so don't, don't try and go off the verse. You will get dizzy and pass out. Um, and I, I keep saying this, but I just want to make this clear. I'm going to discuss a ton of information during this sermon. Most of it, if not like 80% like of it, is going to not be based in Scripture. So if I'm not giving you a chapter and verse, just understand that that might not be, it's, it's not, whatever I say is not inspired. So don't assume that everything I say that is truth, there's going to be a lot of contradictions, 
that go from the, the scripture into tradition and things of that nature. Um, but I will, whenever I can, I will try and preface if it's in scripture or not with a chapter and verse. Um, or if I don't, I just forgot to attach it to my notes because we're talking about 12 guys. So uh, the very first apostle that I want to touch on, and by the way, like I've got 20 pages worth of notes and these are very, this is very small font. So we're, buckle up. If you, uh, this is a very casual service, so if you need to go get coffee, by, by all means. Um, we're going to start with Judas, the son of James. So in Matthew, he's actually mentioned as Thaddeus. Uh, in some of the manuscripts, as you can see, if you have your study Bible underneath attached to that particular name, uh, you'll also, it, more in the margins, more than at the very bottom, but um, some manuscripts mention him as uh, Labaius or Labaius called Thaddeus, uh, according to Matthew 10.3. In Mark, he's mentioned just as Thaddeus. In Luke, he's mentioned as Judas, the son of James. And in John, though he's not necessarily tied to one of our parallel passages, uh, he is mentioned as Judas, not Iscariot, in John 14.2, or 14.22, excuse me. Um, some of the dictionaries, like my personal dictionary that I have at home, uh, also calls him Judas the Zealot. So we'll, we'll get to Zealot in the next apostle. Um, some scholars believe that this is Judas or Thaddeus, uh, that, that, that this Judas or Thaddeus uh, was the author of the epistle Jude. So side note, if this is the case, then this Judas slash Thaddeus would then be the half-brother of Jesus. I'm going to be saying that probably more times than you anticipate. So just a heads up, some of the traditions and some of the people outside of Scripture believe that like half of the apostles were actually brothers of Christ. So it's very interesting. Um, but in Luke 6.16, in the King James Version, it actually makes the claim that Judas was the brother of James rather than Judas, the son of James, um, which would match with Mark 6.3 and Jude 1.1, 1, 1, where if he is the brother of James, more than likely he's talking about James as the, the or James or, or actually in the, the Greek Jacob, um, which is mentioned for the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the epistle of James. Um, Every other mainstream translation of the Bible, so NKJV, NLT, NIV, ESV, CSB, the NASA 20 in 1995, NET, RSV, ASV, everybody else quotes Judas, son of James. So if you go into uh, Luke 6, 16 and check out the interlinear, as I talked about in the, the blb.org, uh, you'll actually see that the KJV adds the phrase, the brother. So it will say in the Greek, Judas of James. And so every other translation is going to say, oh, he came from the line, he came from James, so he's the seed of James, it's, it's his father. Um, but in the KJV, they add the brother to, to put that claim in there. So heads up for that. Um, and nothing in Scripture makes this apostle's picture any clearer including why Luke mentions that this apostle is named Judas rather than Thaddeus. Um, and there's no, there's, there's no conjecture that I can, I can particularly give. So uh, that's a fun mystery for you. Moving on to Simon the Zealot. So the title of Zealot, if you know anything about parts of, of um, either the apocryphal books or uh, Josephus talks a little bit about, obviously, what happens after the Gospels, um, more towards the 70 AD portion. Um, in either of those locations, you're going to find a, a faction of revolutionary men, possibly women, um, but that essentially they were a, a people of freedom fighters that were extremely violent. They were very big on assassinations and planned attacks to essentially try and, and just completely destroy Rome. Because their whole thing was, this government is trying to kill us, we should try and kill them back. Um, 
the, the way that Simon was connected, it was either specifically with the revolutionary faction, or he's just notable as zealous, just generally zealous, either for Jesus or for the Mosaic Law, any, any of that sort, he's, he's a zealous guy. Um, so the revolutionary faction of the zealots, it's, there are two different places that you may be able to find them. It just depends on who you believe. So in the Maccabean Wars, in the, the, uh, the 400 years of silence, after the Old Testament canon is closed with either Malachi or Esther or whichever book was, was written last, which was um, somewhere around 393, 380 BC, uh, there was a time when there were no, no dictations from God. Uh, it even says in the Apocrypha, which is the collection of books that kind of occurred during that time, that they were waiting on a prophet to speak to them. But in that time, um, and in, I don't, I don't know if it's actually tied to 1st or 2nd Maccabees, uh, but in there, in the Maccabean War, there were said to be zealots and, and revolutionary factions types. Um, this you know, would be tied to the destruction of the temple during that time, during the, the 400 years of silence and, and the Maccabean Wars. Um, some scholars actually reject this, and they believe that Simon was noted as someone who was just zealous uh, because it, some people don't believe that the Maccabean Wars, that those zealots were necessarily tied to the Simon the Zealot. And they believe that the zealots were mainly for the Roman Jewish wars that, and, and you know, assassinations and, and violence that occurred closer to 70 AD, um, which the zealots at that point not existing until 30 or 40 years after the events that we're reading about in the, in the Gospels, um, meaning the title wouldn't have carried that particular understanding. In Matthew 10, 4, Simon is known as the Canaanite in the KJV and NKJV, uh, and he's known as the Canaanian in the RSV and ASV, uh, and the Zealot in every other modern translation. Um, Jerome, here he comes, uh, mistranslated the moniker, the title of Simon, um, which in the Greek is uh, kananeos, meaning zealous one. Uh, whenever they translated it into the Canaanite or the Canaanian, they believed that Simon the Zealot was actually from Cana. So they, the, the same place where the miracle of water into wine at the wedding in John, that's what they believed that Simon was from. Thus, they translate him uh, from the KJV and the NKJV and the RSV and the ASV as Canaanite, Canaanian. Um, Simon the Zealot is only mentioned in the parallel passages. So obviously uh, some of the stuff is speculation. Simon also could have been Jesus' brother, according to Matthew 13, 55. Like I said, we're going to be saying that a lot. Um, <laughs> Next, we'll go to the Apostle James, son of Alphaeus. James is often recognized with the nickname James the Lesser or James the Little to distinguish himself from James, son of Zebedee, uh, who was also nicknamed James the Greater, uh, probably because of age or of stature. Some scholars identify this. <laughs> I feel like this is an ongoing joke now. Some scholars identify this James as the brother of Jesus, mentioned in Mark 6.3. And historically, Jerome, and this is going to be, this is probably going to be where we disagree the most, uh, but he noted in his work, The Perpetual Virginity of Blessed Mary, you can see what side he lands on, um, that James the Less was the same as the half-brother of Jesus, which would assign his authorship to the James that wrote the Epistle of James. Um, there is an interesting passage, I will say, uh, in Mark 1540, which mentions a Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. Now, I don't know why Mark puts it in those particular terms, 
because it sounds extremely close to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And with some of the, you know, is this the carpenter's son? With Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Simon. And you see those, and you look at this, and you go, well, these seem like they might be in different languages, but they, they look very close to the same. Um, so this passage could reference James, son of Alphaeus, as the same James, since James was known as the lesser or the little or the younger. Um, this would mean, and this is outside of the apostles, but this is very interesting to just kind of travel this road. This would mean that Mary, after she was with Joseph, then would have been married to Alphaeus. Now, that would, in this case, we have to go with the conclusion that she was not, you know, this was not an adultery situation, but this was a death to Joseph. And we can see pieces of that uh, as we see in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 6, where it says uh, the first son that she has, the first son that she has will carry the dead brother's name. So the, the last important part of this particular theory is that Mary had a son named Joseph in Mark 1540. You can find in other places where Joseph was his actual name. And you can see uh, in the interlinear of both of those verses, uh, it's Eosis, which could be that son, since Yosef, Yosef, uh, which is also the, the Greek of Joseph, is very similar. We're talking about taking an S and replacing it with a P and an H in, in the Greek. So extreme speculation, extreme speculation, not inspired by Scripture, but it's possible. And it's interesting. Um, the fact that, this is, I feel like we're going to keep talking about brothers. The fact that James's father was Alphaeus may also link him to being the brother of Matthew, whom whenever he was called uh, in any of his, uh, either with Matthew or um, with some of the other translations, you're going to see Levi or Matthew, son of Alphaeus. So we have James, son of Alphaeus, Matthew, son of Alphaeus. It's, it's possible. Um, and of course, James is only mentioned in the parallel passages in Scripture. Um, we're going to move on to a more known apostle in Thomas. So Thomas, also known in God, uh, in God's, in John's Gospel, I guess it's God's, uh, as Thomas the twin, only has stories or dialogue in John's Gospel. Um, so Thomas also known as, in the Greek as uh, Didymus, which means twin. So his name actually translates to twin. Uh, so that's probably why it's Thomas the twin. There's a ton of speculation and absolutely nothing in Scripture to tie his twinness to a particular person in the Bible. Um, but that, it's, it's very interesting. Obviously, his name, the, the names in those times meant something. They kind of identified them in some ways. Thomas is also named as Judas Thomas in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, a pseudepigraphal text, meaning, pseudepigraphal meaning that the author is falsely attributed to that particular gospel. Uh, and does not have any authority or inspiration as we would see in Scripture, which is why it's not in our canon. Um, modern scholars would reject that this text would be from Thomas the Apostle, uh, but there is some spillover that scholars may believe that Thomas's name was actually his surname and not his real name, which may have been Judas, um, but they wouldn't call him Judas to distinguish from the other Judases. You know, we've already seen a Judas here, there's a Judas coming, you know, it just, it, it, it would be very hard to, for Jesus to go, hey Judas, and have like three people turn around. Um, from what we know of Thomas, he wasn't a big blind faith guy, uh, but wanted to know a certain future. So Jesus said that they knew where he, he being Jesus, was going, but Thomas said, no we don't, how can we know? Uh, Thomas is also knowing, known as the doubter, you know, doubting Thomas. 
uh, from his time saying, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe, uh, as shown in, in John 20, 25. Uh, Thomas could also be known as empathetic. Uh, when Jesus told the disciples that Lazarus had died and they were going to see Lazarus, Lazarus, uh, Thomas said, let us also go that we may die with him. The phrase, we may die, or apothnesco, apothnesco, excuse me, uh, is translated as to die off or out, uh, and is tied to the separation of the soul and the natural body, according to Strong's Greek Dictionary. So Thomas, there's two different sides to that story. So Thomas might have not might not have been literally saying, let's all go and die of natural causes too, uh, because they probably knew that Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus, and with his master grieving, Thomas uh, may have been showing his empathy to the rest of the disciples. Um, or you could also say, because Jesus was going back into J Judea, into Jerusalem, that, oh, this guy is going to, like, he's going back to the place where they're just going to kill him. So let's just go ahead and, and go with him, because we'll probably die too. Um, so maybe more of a pessimistic approach. Thomas's name is mentioned 11 times in the Gospels plus Acts, uh, four times in the parallel passages, four times in John 20, once after the death of Lazarus, once right before Jesus shares that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and once in the end of John's Gospel before Simon Peter made his second miracle catch. We're going we're gonna to try and move quickly because I, I know I don't really want to do a part two, and I don't think Kyle wants me to. Um, so we're going to jump to Matthew. I'm not going to recreate Kyle's sermon on Matthew and his position as the publican. Uh, but Matthew was known as a tax collector before he was called to be a follower of Jesus. Um, but let's talk about his gospel. So the gospel of Matthew, technically anonymous, but is attributed to Matthew, the tax collector. Um, the, the gospel of Matthew is aimed, well, is said to be aimed directly at the Jews in the community citing more Old Testament scripture than any other gospel, with a total of 102 times that the Old Testament is directly quoted or alluded to. Um, and you can, I, I put everything in the bulletin so that you can see all the breakdown, um, but 102 times in Matthew, 39 times in Mark, 68 times in Luke, 49 times in John, uh, 96 times in Acts. If you go to just direct quotes, Matthew leads the Gospels with 49, compared to Mark's 23, Luke's 25, John's 17, and Acts 29. Um, so Matthew is very, very focused on the Old Testament, proving that Jesus is the Son of David, the Son of Man, everything that the Jews have been waiting for. Um, so this is, this is why that is important. Some scholars believe that because Matthew and Thomas and James are all mentioned together during each listing, that they were brothers. Seeing that Matthew was the son of Alphaeus, but his father isn't mentioned, and that James is mentioned as the son of Alphaeus, leaving Thomas in the middle could maybe signify siblingship, but there's no evidence in Scripture. Um, the name Matthew occurs five times in the Gospels plus Acts with the parallel passages and Matthew's calling in Matthew 9.9. Uh, Matthew, also known as Levi. Levi is mentioned three times in the Gospels of Mark and Luke, where they both mention the calling of Levi Matthew. Next, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a double. Uh, we're gonna go with uh, we're gonna go to Bartholomew and Philip. So the name Bartholomew the Apostle is only mentioned four times in the parallel passages, but he is also known by the name Nathaniel in John's Gospel. The mention of Nathanael is in the story of Jesus calling Nathanael uh, while he's with Philip in John 1, 45 through 49. Uh, he's also mentioned at being in the boat with Peter's second miracle catch at the end of John in 21, 2. Nathanael is mentioned in John 1, 48, being seen by Jesus under the fig tree. There are some creative ways that scholars and creators have attempted to display their understanding of what this could mean, uh, but there isn't a clear inference in any commentaries that I pulled. Uh, and obviously, it was a location that Nathaniel knew intimately uh, because he immediately afterwards declares his faith in Christ and him being the Son of God. So, obviously, it proves something. 
Uh, Philip is surprisingly not scattered throughout the Gospels, uh, but his name is listed in the parallel passages, and we get almost all of our background and context of Philip in the Gospel of John. Philip's name is mentioned 14 times in the Gospel, plus an additional time in Acts, um, just like the rest of the 12. Uh, and it gets, uh, the, you get a lot tougher once you get into Acts to verify who Philip is. Um, so whenever you go into Acts, Acts 6-5 lists seven names of men with good repute. And in there, you'll also keep going, Acts 21-8, Philip the evangelist is listed specifically out of the seven, referring to Acts 6-5. And so in Acts, you don't get a very big understanding of, okay, where's Philip after this? It's kind of, it all bleeds together, and you're like, is this the evangelist? Is this the apostle? You never know once you get into Acts. Philip was rumored to be the other apostle uh, that was with John the Baptist, since P uh, Philip was close to Andrew, who was confirmed as a, a disciple of John, um, close enough to secretly share information in John 12, 22, about some Greeks that were seeking Jesus. Bartholomew is still a mystery, but his connection with Philip is monitored throughout their story. Um, and Philip may be connected with John the Baptist because there's a possibility that Philip was also tied to John. We're going to go do another twofer here. Uh, we're going to go to the apostles James and John, sons of Zebedee. James the Greater, or James the son of Zebedee, is mentioned by name 18 times in the Gospels plus Acts, uh, which is the same number of times that James and John are also mentioned. So anytime that you see John, you're also going to see James in the exact same passage, uh, at least in the Gospels. Uh, James and John were both fishermen as well and worked alongside Simon Peter and Andrew. Uh, they were also both considered very close to Jesus as they were invited to the Mount of Transfiguration uh, with Peter, and they're considered a part of what the, apostle, of what the scholars would call the inner circle of Jesus. Uh, there are six mentions just of the inner circle, and then an extra where Andrew was, was also mentioned. Um, but then uh, Jesus, giving them an awesome nickname, uh, named them the Sons of Thunder. Uh, there's nothing in Scripture to necessarily explain the context, uh, but they did ask Jesus to uh, summon, like if they, if they could consume someone with fire, or just a whole people group uh, in Luke 9, 54. So that might have something to do with it, um, but nothing additional mentioned. And of course, uh, and, and you'll see in the bulletin, John is mentioned way more times than James, uh, especially once you get into Acts. Uh, you'll see uh, the death of James is actually mentioned in the book of Acts. He's the only apostle that had, well, not the only apostle, but the... Uh, the only apostle in the, well, even then, we'll get, we'll get to Judas. But uh, apart from Judas, he's the only apostle that is um, killed in Scripture. And now we'll go ahead and jump to Andrew. So Andrew was the younger brother of Peter, both the son of Jonah slash John, depending on the gospel that you read. Uh, we know that Andrew and Peter were fishermen, and it's shown, it's shown in Scripture that they also shared the same house, uh, Andrew's name is mentioned 12 times in the Gospels plus Acts. Um, I won't, I'll let you guys read it. Uh, but Andrew is mentioned in a smattering of instances. We don't have a ton of information on him except for him being a disciple of John the Baptist. Now, let's go into Judas Iscariot. Iscariot was actually not a surname. It wasn't a last name. Uh, as much as it was a geographical location where Judas was from. So he was the only one of the twelve to be confirmed to not be from Galilee. Uh, his real surname would be Son of Simon, which is mentioned in John 6.71 and uh, John 13.26. Um, I believe that his, his last name is mentioned whenever you, you pull his last name and put it into um, the Litter Bible or any, any sort of Strong's uh, uh, concordance or anything. Uh, Iscariot is actually going to mention the men of uh, Kerioth. It's K-E-R-I-O-T-H. 
um, which is a different region outside of Galilee. Uh, Judas was designated as the treasurer of the Twelve, uh, noted in John 12, 6 and John 13, 29. If you read Mark 14, 4 through 5, it sounds like Judas was being alluded to uh, since it lines up with uh, what we see in John 12, 5. Judas Iscariot was mentioned by name 22 times in the Gospels plus Acts. Most of the dialogue around Judas Iscariot was either around his betrayal, around Judas being identified as the traitor, and around Judas stealing from the treasury. Uh, he's also alluded to many times as the traitor, the betrayer, the son of perdition or destruction, uh, as we see in John 17, 12. Uh, but otherwise, Judas' whole purpose, and this is a, a question that many people ask, what was the purpose? Why did Judas, you know, wh why did Jesus choose Judas? His whole purpose, and this is outlined in Scripture, was to be the guide to those who arrested Jesus to fulfill the Scriptures, as Peter said in his uh, sermon in Acts 1.16. Speaking of Simon, speaking of Peter, let's go to Simon Peter, uh, the last apostle that we will, we will discuss. So I look at my watch and I apologize. Um, so before we get into kind of specific Peter type stuff, there are some things that we need to know uh, about Peter that shed light on the rest of the apostles. So Peter was the only apostle to confirm, to, to be confirmed to be married uh, since Jesus went to his house and healed his mother-in-law. Uh, that's in Luke 4, 38. We discussed that probably months ago. Um, Matthew 17, 24 through 27, Peter is confronted by temple tax collectors. Uh, these weren't the normal tax collectors that you would see portrayed in booths. Uh, that would collect taxes for Rome. These were specifically tax collectors uh, that collected for the upkeep of the temple. Uh, this is actually in accordance with the law of Moses in Exodus 30, 11 through 16. Every year, whenever the census would be taken, everyone would provide a half shekel offering to the Lord. And the point of the passage was just for this particular section, it's not going to be around taxes. We're not talking about paying taxes. I just want to put that out there. That's not the point. But the point from this particular passage is that we know around how old the actual group of disciples were just off of this information. Jesus being around 30 years of age would have, required, would have been required to pay the tax and would have paid the tax. Um, and when he sent Peter to go get the shekel out of the fish's mouth, uh, that actually paid for Peter's part as well. So in Exodus 30, 11 through 16, you will find uh, that only the men, only the Jews that were 20 years or older would be forced to pay the temple tax, which means Jesus and Peter were the only ones over the age of 20. So any representation that you see of the apostles that these guys were like 30, 40 years old is just straight wrong, based on Scripture. Um, and also, it's, it was extremely common for rabbis at that time to be teaching people that were younger than them. It would be very unheard of for a 30-year-old Jesus coming in and being a rabbi to a 50-year-old man. It just wouldn't be um, common in that time. Not impossible that Peter was 50, but obviously... More than likely not. Uh, Simon uh, was also discussed uh, in the miracle catch that I preached on a long time ago in Luke 5. Uh, Luke 5, 3 mentions that Peter was the owner of the boat that they were fishing in. Um, so, so Peter would then uh, essentially be the co-owner of the, co -owner of the uh, Barjona Brothers Fishing Company, um, possibly doing business alongside Zebedee. Uh, since it was Zebedee who was left to uh, be with the hired servants in uh, Mark 1.20 as the, the, um, the same story of the miracle catch. Um, obviously, this was a, a lot bigger of an operation than just a, a dude with a couple of schooners. You guys didn't know I knew that word. Um, Peter was obviously a businessman of some sort. He could have been the CEO of this operation, 
Uh, there was possibly like a guild or a club in Galilee that was specific for fishing. Uh, it could have been all on Zebedee. But either way, complete speculation and conjecture. Um, there's nothing laid out in Scripture about this. Uh, Peter doesn't have a smattering of verses like his brother Andrew because he is the focal point of the apostles at this time. He is the de facto leader of the apostles. Um, that's why you will see in every single list that Peter is first every single time. Uh, the, the name Simon for the apostle is mentioned 39 times in the Gospels. The name Peter is mentioned 149 times in 144 verses in Gospels plus Acts. Uh, Simon Peter is mentioned 17 times in the Gospels plus Acts. So when the Bible says whom he named Peter, he wasn't kidding, because this guy is literally documented as Peter, as Peter the Apostle, more than any other apostle had been documented in the, entire, the entirety of the Gospels, period. So, like I said, definitely leader of the group. So, that's, we're, we're done with the apostles. Um, feels like a, possibly a college course, but um, I talked to, I, I'm, I'm going to still point it out. I talked to Mitch last week before I did all my studying and everything, and I was like, I, I feel like I always need to have some sort of a takeaway or things, but this, there's not really a whole lot that I can give as a takeaway for this. And he said, oh, you'll figure it out. There's always a takeaway. Um, so I, I figured, figured one out. <laughs> um, the, the big takeaway, the focus of this passage, like we said in the beginning, obviously in your study Bibles, you're not going to see a whole lot of commentary on this or any of the parallel passages. Um, because the Bible just doesn't give us a clear picture of the 12 apostles. All their occupations all their genealogies, all their attributes, all their characteristics. The Bible does give a load of focus on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the Bible focusing on the most important person that ever walked the earth is the focus. So it's a great reminder that Every single person in the Bible is never given the same spotlight as Jesus, period. The entire Bible is messianic in nature. He's the one. He's the whole point. Luke is giving an orderly account here. He gives it again in Acts, as they're the same scroll, um, after Jesus ascended. For us, when we look at this passage, we need to remember that this list isn't given to us to make a big deal about these 12 guys, even though I just spoke for like an hour and a half. Um, they aren't the focal point of the Gospels. Jesus is. It's not about them. It's about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not about us. It's about the, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. With that said, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for you giving me this opportunity to, to preach and, Lord, just giving us the opportunity to be here. I pray for those who, who weren't here this morning um, through sickness, through trials. Lord, I just continue to pray for this church as we're going into some times of trials and of questions and um, things that, that Satan may be using to try and shake us. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to remind us that the whole point, the whole point of what we're doing is for the glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we would be saturated by that truth and that we would continue to live in that truth every single day. It's in Jesus' name we ask this all. Amen.